But I guess uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, we're going to start with maybe not where you would expect. And uh, we'll start with just kind of talking about the fact that uh, static sites doesn't actually mean uh, static sites are probably at least not in the way that you think it does traditionally. Uh, so you hear the word static sites, and you might think of something like this, like a really basic uh, HTML page with just a header and a piece of text. You might think of something like this, which is still basic, but has links and a little like mouse icon and stuff like that. Or maybe something a little bit fancier and you've got like this blog layout with a sidebar and you get your pretty uh, pink colors. Or maybe, just maybe, you think of something so amazing like this Space Jam website, which coincidentally is still available out there for you to go and look at. I don't know if it's spacejam.com or where it is, but you can uh, search and find it. But regardless of which one of these things you might think of when you hear static sites, it's important to know that the landscape of web development has changed drastically over the last 15 years, 10 years, five years, even the last year, things move so quickly. And so today, static sites doesn't really mean what uh, it used to back in the day. So welcome to this talk, static sites and serverless functions, where hopefully you will see just how dynamic your static sites can be when you pair them with uh, the power of serverless functions. So thanks everyone for being here. I see a couple of comments in the chat. I appreciate that. It does uh, feel encouraging to see people responding, at least with a few comments. Uh, my name is James Q Quick, and I am a developer, a speaker, and a teacher. And I've done some combination of those things for about the last seven, uh, seven and a half years or so. If you're interested in anything social media or my website, James Q Quick on everything, Twitter and Instagram and GitHub and jamesqquick.com. And I am a, a actually developer advocate at Auth0. And uh, what I do, you'll hear a little bit about Auth0 throughout this uh, demonstration or this talk, but I do uh, a lot of content. I do a lot of community engagement and I help people use our product. And that's kind of the sweet spot for me where I get to talk at conferences like this and uh, just get to be engaged with people, which is really what I enjoy. I also have the privilege of uh, representing another really cool company in Twilio as a Twilio uh, champion or an ambassador for Twilio. So the cool thing is you'll get to hear a little bit about both Auth0 and Twilio in this talk and how they work together. So as part of this talk, I uh, need some interaction from the audience actually. So uh, one thing that would be really useful for me at this point is if you're watching the talk, uh, if you would tweet about it, if you have a Twitter account and include the hashtag JQQuickTalks and then my handle at JamesQQuick. Uh, just a little bit of foreshadowing, this will be a part of the demo. So hopefully uh, you will uh, take my request seriously and, uh, and go ahead and do that or otherwise the demo is not gonna work so well. So take a second and uh, give a short tweet, just to include the hashtag and, the, um, and my handle there if you don't mind. So let's start by just addressing what static sites are. And you could, uh, just like everyone else, you could go to Wikipedia, the source of all truth, and uh, you could find their definition here. And a static web page uh, delivered to user, exactly as stored, in contrast to a dynamic uh, page. So there's a few things that really stick out to me. Uh, the first one is exactly as stored. So what this means is, in contrast to dynamic web pages, is when you make a request to a given page, there's no calculation being done on that page. There's an HTML file sitting there, and then that HTML file just get, get, gets sent directly back to you as the, the consumer or the visitor of a given website. In contrast to dynamic web pages or kind of more traditionally server-side rendered pages, uh, a couple of different terms you can use there, where uh, there's some sort of uh, calculation going on on the server. So if you ask for a page, it might have to go to a database to get the information that it needs, Based on that information, it will render an HTML page and send it back to you. So that's the definition according to Wikipedia. According to me, a static site is a, a collection of static assets uh, that are, and maybe I shouldn't use the static in the definition of static sites, but a collection of assets that are served directly from a server or a, C, or a CDN, CDN being a content delivery network. But basically what this means is you have a set of files and HTML, CSS, JavaScript files, you can throw them up on some sort of server and then as the previous definition stated, those things are just sent directly back to a user with no real time calculation going on. So you think about these static sites and you may be wondering like, how would you create these? Well, uh, vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you could use those technologies that you're uh, used to to build your static site because those are the actual files that go up there. 
You could also use a front end framework like Angular Reactor Vue. And uh, maybe some of the people listening now are, are uh, maybe turned off or you're kind of questioning how does Angular Reactor Vue relate to a static site? Well, if you go back to my definition of a static site, it's a set of assets that you can put up or host somewhere. And those things get sent down directly to a user. And that's exactly what these frameworks do. These frameworks are used for building very dynamic uh, web applications, but at the end of the day, they have a build process and you do an NPM run build, for example, the output of that build is a static set of files that you then go and host on some sort of server. So in my definition, Angular, Reactive View are all able to build static sites. So what if you have lots of pages? Those things kind of work if you have a handful of pages, you have an about page and a um, an info page or like whatever it is. But what if you have a big blog with hundreds of pages? Well, you could create the individual HTML pages yourself, but you're probably not going to do that. So your alternative, especially in the modern web, is to use what's called a static site generator. Now, the most common example uh, use case of a static site generator is uh, with a blog. So you'd have some of my dogs jumping around back there. With a static site generator, uh, building a blog, you'd have some sort of uh, data source for your blog post. And what a static site generator will do is that build time, it will go and grab the information for each post and it will generate the static page for each one individually. So this is really important. In a static site generator world, you still interact with a data source. And I'm being intentional not to say database necessarily, more of a source of data than a database. So you still interact with a data source, just like a dynamic site would. If you think about a traditional WordPress site, you visit a page, uh, the server will go to the database to get the blog information, it will bring that back and then uh, send back the HTML page. So you still do that sort of interaction, but the difference is when that interaction happens. So let's take a look at comparing these. With a static site generator, that interaction, the interaction with the data source takes place at build time. The interesting implication of this is anytime you add new content to your site, you add a new blog post, for example, that then means you have to do another build on your site because the only way you see that content in your static site is by going through another build process. So some of the benefits here is speed because these are not doing any real-time calculation. They're super fast. You're not having to maintain a server, which means you're a little bit more secure. There's less security risks to think about. The development experience is really great. You check stuff into source code, it automatically builds and it's kind of done. And the ease of use, again, from a developer perspective, with the things that I've worked on, there's been no easier way to get up and started with a blog than this. So if we contrast that with a dynamic site, when do we interact with a data source? Well, we do that real time. When you make a request for a given blog post, again, it's going to a data source database of some sort. It's grabbing that information real time and then generating that page. And so the biggest implication of that versus static sites is that when you add new content, there's no additional builds that are necessary. They will kind of automatically be taken care of by doing that real-time call to a data source. So the benefits here, no extra builds necessary. And this has kind of been the established strategy for several years now. You think about Ruby on Rails, you think about WordPress, and your traditional server-side rendered pages, that's been around for a long time, and it's something that people are really comfortable with. So a few examples of static site generators. If you're kind of new to this world, um, I spent a lot of time in the React world. So there's Next.js uh, and Gatsby. And these things aren't necessarily limited to being static site generators. They just can do that. They can generate static pages. So in the React world, Next and Gatsby and vanilla JavaScript, there's Eleventy. In the Vue.js world, there's Nuxt and uh, Gridsome. And then Hugo is Go and Jekyll is Ruby. So there's all these different ones. And in this case, you'll see more about Gatsby here in a second is the one that I use in this demo. And all of this talk about static sites and some of its benefits really gets into the idea of the Jamstack. Now, this is not a Jamstack talk necessarily, but all of this stuff is hyper relevant to the Jamstack. And so just kind of defining what this is, I'm sure you, or you may have seen this before, you may not, but Java or Jam stands for JavaScript as the J. APIs in the A and M for markup. And it's interesting that Jamstack is becoming such a popular thing right now. I love the Jamstack. I talk a lot about the Jamstack. But the interesting aspect of this is JavaScript APIs markup. None of those things are new. Those things have been around for a long time. We've used JavaScript for a long time. We've used APIs for a long time. And we've used markup. None of those things individually are new. 
So the Jamstack is really just a new way of how we think about building web applications. And I think maybe with a demo, this will be uh, become a little bit more obvious of this is not quite the type of thing that you're probably used to. And the way we leverage or the way we build out some of the functionality in this application, the demo that we'll talk about is with serverless functions. That's kind of the second half of this talk. And uh, just the way we started off with a misnomer in static sites, not meaning static sites um, or not meaning static experiences, for example, serverless functions doesn't actually mean serverless. Uh, what it means is you, the developer, me, the developer, we don't have to worry about maintaining a server ourselves, which is actually a really uh, nice situation to get into. I don't know if we have any server admins or anything like that, DevOps people in the chat. Uh, if you are, let me know. Uh, but those are the types of things that developers usually don't want to have to worry about. We want to write code and that be the thing that we spend our time doing. So the really cool thing about serverless functions, and you'll see this in a second, is that you write a function, literally a function, you include it in your source code. And then for the most part, magic happens. That function in the demo that we'll see gets picked up by Netlify as the host. It automatically gets deployed behind the scenes using AWS Lambda functions. And then that thing is there to be used in as any other endpoint would be on any given server. So there's a lot of magic that goes on, which actually makes the development experience of these type of applications really easy. So we've talked kind of in theory so far, and I think it's time to talk about what the actual demo is. I referenced there being a demo here, and I think this is the most exciting part of this talk. Um, so let's go ahead and break down what this demo is. And what I wanted it to be, is a site where I can track all of the talks that I give. So as a speaker, uh, if you're a speaker, if you've given talks in the past, you've probably been in a situation where you give a talk and then you say, hey, I've got slides available at so-and-so. Uh, a little a foreshadowing here, there will be slides available, so you'll see this in the demo as well. But I wanted to be able to track that for the conferences or events that I talk at. Here's what I spoke about. Here's a link to the slides. Here's a link to the conference and that sort of stuff so that I could send people to that page and they could see all the talks that I've given. So a couple of uh, requirements when I thought about doing this demo, I wanted to easily host this thing. I want there to be static pages for my talks. I want there to be interactive feedback. This is one of the big things that we as speakers miss out on is actually being able to get feedback from people. Usually in, during a talk or right after a talk, a couple of people in person might come up and say, hey, you did a good job but rarely do we have people that are giving actual feedback. Uh, most of the people will have maybe something negative to say, just kind of walk away and go to a different talk right after. So I would love to get some interactive feedback from uh, people that have been in my talks. I would love to get alerts when new pieces of feedback come in. So I know I can check and see what those pieces of feedback are. And then I also want this thing to be secure. So just gonna walk through and break down the technologies that are used in this demo. Uh, first is Gatsby. And uh, this says here static site generator, but it is important just for a branding thing and awareness to know Gatsby is not just a static site generator, but in this case, I'm using it to generate static pages for the site. So there's your, your much more there. And what happens is I go and grab at build time, all of the talks. So all the information for all of the talks, we'll see more about this in a second get all of those pieces of information. And then with each one, we then create a page. So at build time, we're gonna create all of the individual pages for the talks that I've given. And then interestingly, we're using Trello here as a database or a data source. So uh, hands up, I can't see people, but uh, maybe a, a thumbs up in the chat. If you have, I see a raised hand from Ryan, thank you. If you've used Trello before, usually people associate this and this is how I use it as well as a Kanban board or something like that to track your to-do items and things. But it has a really great API and it already has a GUI built in. So I thought, why not actually use that as a database or a data source here? And so what I do is when I add a new talk to my site, it will add a new card to Trello and it will have the information for it. And then it will do some other things behind the scenes that we'll talk about in a second. So in addition to that, I told you I wanted to have feedback. Well, this is where a really cool company in Twilio comes in where when someone submits feedback, I want to then get a text message or an email, but in this case, a text to show me that someone's actually given feedback on this talk. And I can see that right inside of my phone. So Twilio has a really nice uh, API here where you create a client uh, with your credentials and then you call messages.create and you tell it uh, what's in the body, who the from number is and what the to number is. In this case, it's sending the message to me. So then I get to see whatever that feedback is. 
I like the positive uh, comment from Steve. Thank you. Wow, this is creative. I have a lot of fun with this demo. And next up, I wanted to have some sort of uh, really just kind of proving to you how interactive a static site can be. So what I wanted to do is show recent tweets by a given hashtag, hint, hint, a hashtag that we've already seen before. So if you hopefully are participating in this demo and want to see this take place in the demo, uh, use the hashtag JQQuickTalks and then include my handle at JamesQQuick and we'll see those show up in a second. And again, Twitter has a really nice uh, API here where you can call client.get and tell it what you want to search by and then use the hashtag that you want to search by. It's actually uh, fairly straightforward, which is nice. Uh, lastly, or second to lastly, I think we're using Auth0. So I'm using this for my application security. And it's kind of interesting. The very first time I gave this talk, I didn't have any so sort of security uh, tied into the application. So other people were submitting talks and kind of spamming uh, my application. Now I've got Auth0 set up where I'm the only one that can do that. And so we've got a really great uh, React SDK to be able to get hooks in here to tell whether a user is authenticated, to trigger a login, a logout, that sort of thing. Now, I see a question from uh, Brad. Uh, what was the hashtag? It's JQQuickTalks. So hashtag JQQuickTalks. And there will be a little shortcut here uh, that you can see in a second in case you missed that again. All right, lastly on the, uh, thank you, Ryan, yeah, for including that. Lastly, on the technology side, we're using Netlify. So Netlify is a great host for static sites as well as a host of serverless functions. And I can't tell you how easy this is. With ha hosting my site inside of Netlify, inside of my uh, source code, I'll show you this in a second, I've got a functions directory. Each one of those files is uh, just a function that you see on the screen. Netlify takes care of the rest. Netlify grabs those files, it hosts them as serverless function, and there is, they're available as an endpoint, a backend API, just like any other full-fledged server would be, although I didn't have to do anything special. I just write code. And after Netlify picks that up, you can see they've got their functions tab here, which will show that they've gotten picked up. You can see logs and things like that. So if you're interested, uh, you can, again, slides will be available later. You could search James U Quick and talk track. So you don't need to copy this uh, whole link down necessarily, but the source code is available. So if you wanna go check it out, you absolutely can. But this is the point where we've talked about what the demo is. I think we should just show it. And I think that would be kind of the best use of our time. So let me scroll over. And let me start out at talktrack.netlify.app. So this is the demo here. And this is live. I would encourage, actually, I would request uh, for everybody that is watching to go out and go to this site. And what you can see is I've got a list of talks that I've given. So I talked about React and Serverless, something similar, a full stack jam stack made easy at uh, Dev Nation. I've got a link to the slides here. I've got the date. I've got the feedback form so people can leave feedback here and so on and so on. So that's really cool. Now, let me log in. We'll go through this login process here. And I guess I'll show if I get a bunch of spam emails, I guess I'll just have to get rid of them. No one's really spammed it so far, so I think we'll be okay. So I'm logged in here. And when I now add a talk, uh, or when I now that I'm logged in, I can see the ability to add a talk. So I got some of this information already done. Uh, this is all things open as the conference. And the date, I'm going to copy, I always forget the format, but I'm going to copy one of those dates and it's the 20th and the slides are available here. We've got some little shortcuts in here and the description is here. Now, before I add this talk, I want to show you uh, Trello. Uh, so inside of Trello, these cards are the different pieces of information, the different uh, talks that I've given with all the information required that showed up in that homepage when you first pulled up. Hopefully you have it up and you can see it yourself. So what I want to happen is when I create this new talk, it should then add a new card to Trello. So let's actually run this. Let's do a submit and I don't have a loading indicator. So hopefully it's going okay, now it's done. Cool, so that got, that got added. And if I scroll down, I now have a new card in here that has title, conference slides, date, description. It has all the information that I need, which is fantastic. That's exactly what I'm looking for. And now if I go back to my homepage and I refresh, I would have expected to see that new talk except for one thing. If you remember back to the idea of static sites, when you add new content, it requires a new build. So one of the cool things that's going on behind the scenes, if I look inside of TalkTrack and I look inside of my deploys, it actually kicked off an automatic build behind the scenes. You can see this thing is actually building real time and we'll give this a little time to finish. But in the code now, what I want to show you is a couple of things. 
One is inside of my functions directory, there's a add talk function. Now, again, in Netlify, you have the ability to just add one of these functions into your source code, check it in, and Netlify takes care of the rest of actually hosting that thing as a serverless function. So inside of here, you can see that I am requiring a given permission. So for a logged in user, I'm requiring that they have a specific user. So even if you created an account and tried to add a talk, you would not be able to do this because I'm checking permissions in addition to the user being logged in. So authentication as well as authorization at this point. From there, I grab the information that I need off of the body and I create the header and the card content. And then I call Trello, create card. So that's where this card inside of Trello comes from is that API call that you see there. But that's not all that happens. I also make a call to a URL, which is the Netlify build hook. So what that does is it calls to kick off this build in Netlify behind the scenes. So that's how that thing got triggered automatically to go ahead and rebuild because there's new data that I want to see on the site. So hopefully, fingers crossed, when I do a refresh here, I should now see this new talk. So here's the static sites and serverless functions at all things open, and I can click on this and go to this page. Uh, that actually is pretty cool. Now I wanna show you what this build process actually looks like. If we look in the Gatsby node file, you saw a little bit of a snippet on this before, but I grab all of the talks from Trello. So there's a get cards for list. So from that list, I grab all the cards, I format those talks a little bit. And then for each one of them, I create the individual page. So for each one of those talks, I've now got a static page that should be super fast. Again, I don't have a traditional backend. I'm not maintaining a server. I'm using serverless functions. And I would say this stuff works pretty well, at least to me. So at this point, a couple of things that you might uh, notice, actually a question in, in here from Steve, what triggered your build to kick it off that is the, I'm going to reorder these a bit. Uh, that is the call to the Netlify build hook. So this thing is making a post request to the Netlify build hook, something that Netlify gives you. And uh, then it's telling it to go ahead and build. At build time, it's going out to Trello and now grabbing all the information to generate those pages. So it's automatically triggering the build. And then during the build, it's going and getting all the information again from Trello, which is how then you have these new pages that are generated. So if you're on this page, and hopefully you are, a couple of things you'll notice. One, I have a tweet JQ Quick Talks button. I don't quite know why this doesn't seem to be working. If anybody wants to uh, share with me what I'm missing on here, please do. But it does include in the URL, you can see the hashtag that uh, you would use in this demo. So you can go ahead and do that there. Um, then the other thing to notice, and I see other people have already participated in this. So I'm gonna do a risky thing as a speaker. I'm going to uh, turn my volume up to loud and hopefully show you something cool. So if uh, somebody can go in and leave a piece of feedback right now, what this will do is that will submit this feedback. And actually, I think this is uh, kind of a cool uh, little rating system here that I built. But if you can leave a piece of feedback real time, like right now, hopefully, uh, what this will do or what will happen when you do is it will call the add feedback function it will check, it will grab the information. It will check to see whether or not I want the text alerts to be on, which in this case, they should be set to true. And then if they are, it will send me a text message. So hopefully, I already got one, but it was before I turned my, my volume up, so you won't have heard it. But if someone can send me one in the next few seconds, hopefully you'll be able to hear that. But all of that is kicked off through a serverless function. So when you click submit, it's gonna send it off to that serverless function. This thing will receive that information and then handle the submission of, or the sending of the text. Still waiting on, sometimes it has a little bit of a delay. So a uh, comment from Ryan about the button. I think I just got one, but it didn't sound off. Okay, unfortunately it didn't sound off, but if you can see that at all, uh, that piece of feedback is coming through okay and has, uh, now they're actually coming through. Still not, I don't know what's wrong with audio, but a lot of these are coming through. And uh, the one interesting thing that I think I saw someone uh, show is that they're sending uh, some cross-site scripting stuff. They're trying to inject uh, script in there. I'm not displaying these pieces of feedback anywhere. So if I look at your feedback, these are not becoming HTML. So I think someone said, sorry, I won't try to show your email, but uh, someone included a script there that won't be displayed. So we should be okay there. Uh, I'm going to come back to Ryan's uh, message about the URL, something about the formatting, hopefully will be updated. Uh, but there we go. Uh, hopefully it's okay for now. 
The other thing that I want to show, and this is kind of the last piece of just showing you how hopefully dynamic static sites can be, is that interaction with Twitter to start. So if you've interacted with Twitter in the sense of using that hashtag, even though that button is broken, so I'm sorry, but using that hashtag and then including my handle, what it will do is it should show these things now inside of this tweet section. So this is not quite real time. This is not going out and continuously polling. What it does is when I load this page on a static site, you still have the ability to run JavaScript. And now I can see here are the comments or tweets that have included that hashtag. And so what happens here is the uh, another function here for search tweets. This is a serverless function. And I guess I'm still logging these out or logging out searching tweets. I don't really need that log. What I'm checking in here to uh, do that same code snippet that you saw before where it's doing a search tweets and then it's just hard coded to that JQ quick talks. And this is in a static site where you're able to run JavaScript real time and query these things and get this information and display it, which I think is pretty cool. So I'm going to hold off on a couple of questions that I think um, I'm going to hold off on these questions and we'll just discuss them just fully in the next like two or three minutes because this is basically all the demo I want to show. So we'll move pretty quickly to the uh, to the questions here in a second. But all of that stuff, all these dynamic capabilities, at least from my perspective, being pretty dynamic, being relatively not necessarily real time, although it could be if I implement in polling, able to tie in all of these different things with static sites and static pages and all of that sort of stuff. So We've got feedback, we've got, um, we've got Twitter, we've got automatic building of our site. We've got a lot of stuff going on. So a couple of resources as we leave, one is the source code. So if you wanna check out the source code and see all of it behind the scenes, you absolutely can. I also have a React and serverless course. So this gets into how to use serverless functions inside of Netlify and doing the same sort of stuff that you saw in this demo. Uh, you can check out that course at jamesqquick.com slash courses. You can see that course listed there. And a couple of additional things. Uh, if you're, well, one, I would uh, appreciate some feedback. So real feedback. And this is a slightly different way for you to give this feedback. But if you do, you have the opportunity to get some free swag and an Aussie t-shirt. So if you don't mind, if you have time, if you have feedback, I would love to hear it at a0.2.to slash feedback dash jqq. Uh, if you fill that out and uh, tell a little bit of information about you, just like general things about you as a developer, uh, you have the ability to get an Aussie or a t-shirt and I would appreciate the feedback and it would be good to see just people being engaged from this talk. So you can go check that out. If you also have questions on the Aussie side, you can message me at james.quick at .com. Also, if you were interested in the slides, you could go to two places. You could go to the demo site that you're on now, the talktrack.netlify.app. I also post all this stuff on my own personal site at jamesqquick.com slash talks. You'll see the most recent talk, which is this one, and you can go and grab the slides from there as well. And then lastly, uh, thanks everyone for being here, especially for participating in the demo. This doesn't do a whole lot if people aren't interacting. So I appreciate your interaction and your questions. And I guess that's kind of uh, the point that we're at now. We're actually doing really well on time. So 15 minutes for questions. And I think what I'm gonna do is just kind of scroll back up to one that I missed from Tom and start there. And then uh, feel free to throw additional questions in the chat as I go through it. So Tom asks, uh, what about the user experience while the new entry is being rebuilt and not available in the list UI? How do you let them know uh, their operation was successful, but that the presentation is still being updated? That's a great question. So one of the things that you could, you could do is like you could do a, a feedback message, an alert message of some sort to, uh, to myself. Like in this case, I'm the only one that's uploading talk. So I'm the only one note that knows that something could be going on. So you could do a little feedback message if I were allowing other people to do this, just to say like, hey, your, your thing has been submitted correctly. Uh, it's building, it'll be available in a couple of minutes. Another interesting thing you could do is uh, I saw this, there's like the lollipop. Let me actually pull this up because it's a really cool demo. Lollipop Jamstack. I don't even know what to search exactly. Uh, let's see the pre-generated uh, Jamstacks. This is from uh, Phil, Hawks Phil Hawksworth, a really cool, great demo. And what he does here is uh, he lets you generate static pages for a lollipop. So you pick like a, a top, middle and a bottom part to your lollipop. And you put them all together and that's your lollipop. And uh, it will, when you create it, it will kick off that build process and look to get that thing added to the site. 
In the meantime, if you share that link with someone and they try to access that lollipop, if it doesn't find it already as a static page, it will go and grab that information dynamically out of the database and then render that page appropriately, which is wildly cool because you have this, this um, interim state of when you're kind of waiting on the thing to be rebuilt, you can still get it. It's just not coming from a static page. And then when that static page is actually finished building and it's available, you can go and grab it just like you would have expected to originally. So there's some tips and tricks and, and kind of a little bit hacky things that you can do. And that's kind of the nature of the, the, um, the way static sites work, I guess, overall is, is what I'm trying to say. And, and that's okay because you're not going to use them in a scenario where you're constantly updating data. Uh, if you use it for a blog, if you use it for, in this case, the list of talks that I give, I only add a new blog once a week or so. I only add a new talk once every couple of weeks, right? So I'm not doing a bunch of real-time up, uploading of information. Uh, so anyway, it fits really well for this example. It fits for lots of examples. And there are some, some interim things you could do to give a better uh, user experience, but also know that like if people didn't upload that thing, they don't know that anything's going on. So just when it's available, they will see whatever that next uh, piece of data is. So question from Steve, how much does this cost cite you or how much does this site cost you at Netlify small enough under a free tier? Absolutely. This is, uh, yeah, I've never paid and you can see on my Netlify where I scroll back up to uh, my team, look at all these demos and sites that I have here. I've never paid a dime to Netlify. Uh, and I think that they've really done this right where they give you a lot of leeway as a developer to build whatever it is that you want to a really, really good free tier. And if I got to the point where I needed something paid, I would be happy to pay Netlify to do it because of how amazing they've been so far. So I think they've really nailed this with really just getting developers involved. Developers then take those conversations to their jobs and then jobs start using Netlify and start paying uh, money for whatever features and scale they need. So I think they've really done this right. Uh, question in Q&A, how to manage uh, different environments, like environment variables, uh, different... Um, different static pages. Sure. So I, um, I don't know if this will actually, I think this will show my credentials. So I probably need to be careful, but inside of Netlify in uh, your site settings under deploy, build and deploy, there's environment variables here. So you can set environment variables just like you would anywhere else. You could have them be different while you're running locally. I have a .env and a .env development. Uh, those are um, not necessarily, Anyway, uh, those are set up for different things right now, but you could use these in any way that you want to, and you could have your different environments. You can also do uh, like staging environments inside of Netlify based on a different, um, a different branch. So actually a little fun fact here on my personal page, James Q Quick, I've got uh, develop.jamesqquick.com. And anytime I push something to my develop branch, it will automatically do the staging here. I don't think I have anything that's changed. I think this is all kind of uh, up to date, but... Uh, you can do that uh, inside of Netlify as well. So um, how does local dev work with this setup? Uh, Steve, do you have any specific questions? It, like I run Gatsby develop, or actually, I, sorry, I run Netlify dev. So Netlify dev lets you run your serverless functions as well as your front end application. So that allows me to run Gatsby develop and my serverless functions at the exact same time. And that takes care of all of it. It's, it's really, really cool the way it works. Um, so I highly recommend using it. I know uh, like if you do Next.js and, and you use Vercel for hosting, like they have a similar thing. Uh, Next.js has your API routes and stuff already kind of like really built in. The only thing that you have to do with Netlify is give it a configuration file to just tell it where those functions actually live. So in this case, I'm just specifying where my functions, well, they actually live in a directory called functions. And again, Netlify takes care of the rest, which is really, really neat. Uh, so question about from Unis, uh, the money that is the question, what about Twilio or Trello? Well, uh, I'm not paying money for either one of those. Uh, with Tre Trello, uh, you can like, I don't know what the free tier is exactly, but you can have a ton of information in Trello. And if you look at the amount of times that I've given this talk, it's been about 10 total. So it'd be a long time before I would actually hit any sort of limit inside of uh, Trello. So I don't really have a whole lot to worry about there. The other case is uh, Twilio, and I can't remember right offhand what like the free tier will allow you, um, but at least for this demo, I haven't uh, paid any money myself. 
And you might get into the point where, um, depending on what your scale is, like maybe you don't need the text message alerts. It's okay if you if you don't need them. I think it's just kind of cool to add here. But yes, at a certain point, you would uh, break out of a, a free tier for any of these, but I would say they're, they're all pretty generous and I haven't paid any money for the specific demo and the things that you've seen here. Hopefully that answers that question. Does Netlify Dev play nice with Scully, Angular Static Site Generator? I'm not 100% sure, um, but I, I, I think the answer is yes. And the reason is basically what Netlify Dev does, it's going to do something to the extent of looking in your package.json file and running a command. So assuming there's like a Scully develop, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something like that, Scully start or Scully develop. Uh, that's what uh, the Gatsby develop command is, right? So this Gatsby develop has the built-in live reloading server and it goes through the build process and all that stuff. So what Netlify dev does is it will just literally run one of those commands and then it will also run the serverless functions and then it does some proxying behind the scenes. So it seems as if they're running on the same domain, the same port and they can talk to each other without cross-origin issues. So I don't know this for a fact, but I, I can almost bet you that Netlify Dev will play nice with Scully because Netlify's Dev is pretty abstracted away from whatever the front end or the, the framework is for the front end. Um, it's pretty abstracted away from whatever it is. It just needs to know how to call a, a specific command that will do that run. Now it is smart enough. I've never specified that it should run this develop command. I don't think that's not in my, or maybe it looks in my Netlify, go away. Netlify Tomal. No, that's the production command. Yeah. So it's it's smart enough to kind of realize that stuff on its own. I don't know if it's smart enough to realize Scully on its own. I imagine it is uh, from the reasons that I just said. But if not, I don't know this either. But I'm assuming you could also tell it uh, what command to run alongside of the serverless functions and then be good to go that way. Hopefully that answers those questions. All right, we've got uh, we've got eight. I think I assume the original time is still the same of forty five minutes. We've got eight minutes. If anybody else has any questions, wants to see a snippet of code, wants to share how their day has been so far, <laughs> how have the rest of the talks been today? By the way, any uh, any good ones that people saw? Oh, hey James, this is uh, Bryce, the moderator. You have as much time as you want. Your last one of the day. Okay. Well, yeah, and I don't think we'll take more than that, but I appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Or maybe we will. We could do like three or four more talks together. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm going to be done after this. Cool. Uh, Steve, thanks for the feedback. I appreciate it. Did someone say all nighter from Ryan? Yeah, we can hang out here and, and do this all day. Well, with not holding people up and... Uh, being respectful of people's times, I think I think we'll probably just call it. If anyone has any questions, I think I left uh, kind of contact information and stuff up here, slides at uh, at my site. Uh, check out the feedback form, and uh, you could leave feedback in a couple of different ways. Either way is great, but if you want to also try to get an Aussie T-shirt, uh, you can do that on this link here. Email me at uh, james.quick at Aussie and then James Q. Quick on everything: YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all that sort of stuff. Uh, maybe last question here. Any other uses you have given to this topic? Uh, yeah, I've done lots. Uh, one of the ones that I'm pretty proud of that I've been working on recently is dev setups. So this is using uh, similar technologies. This is, and Ryan has been involved in this. Uh, so this is kind of good timing for him to be here. Uh, this is a way for people to upload images of their desk and a way for other people to kind of scroll through and see what other people's desk setups look like. And I made some progress in just design here. Yeah, Ryan, this has changed a little bit. Uh, but I think it looks really cool. It's got the masonry layout. Uh, you can go and see a little bit more information about a person, just kind of their Twitter information. I'll link to their uses page if they have one. And uh, oh, not that button, sorry. Uh, just going back here. So anyway, that one is really cool. It is, um, it's using Netlify for hosting as well as serverless functions, Cloudinary for images, Auth0 for login, uh, what else, Tailwind for CSS, uh, React on the front end. So again, this React and serverless combination I've done a ton with this stuff. I really enjoy it. Um, so yes, lots of lots of other use cases uh, for these types of technologies being uh, being combined. Yeah, which uh, so let me scroll down. Which one is the Rick and Morty one? Oh, there we go. That one. Is that right? Yeah, Tech Gadget. There you go. Yep. 
Uh, so yeah, Ryan, who happens to be here, has done some work on this, which is really cool, and then has his um, has a picture of his setup on here too. Yeah, I like the way this masonry layout turned out. There's a I forget which library I used, but it's a React one that took care of most of the stuff for me. <clears throat> okay, well, again, in respect of everyone's time, uh, I think we'll go ahead and call it a day. I appreciate everyone being here and having questions and interacting and hanging around to the end of the day. And if you have any follow-up questions, uh, social media, website, and james.quick at Osiro, I'd love to uh, love to help you out later on. So thanks again for being here.